Zone. I'm Mark Ebner. I'm a multi-award winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author, and I'm a private investigator. How do you like that? Lands me right in the gray zone, you know? It's sort of like so, so, sometimes, you know, they talk about the twixt and the twain meeting. Sometimes I'm all three. A story turns into a book, turns into an investigation, and uh, that's how it works. You got your PI license, Carl. I'm sitting here with Carl Kozlowski. He's a reporter, a comedian, and uh, he brought me into this madness. You got your PI license yet, buddy? Uh, no, I'm not as uh, not as uh, spectacularly qualified as you, but that's why you're here. It helps. It helps. It helps me to the point where if I'm doing an investigation, in the words of... Uh, my buddy Bob DC, he was an undercover uh, cop in Canada for 25 years, spent probably 24 of those years completely undercover. Wow. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine going through an airport or something like that and somebody sees you like a relative when you're doing a drug bust or something like that? <laughs> hey, Uncle Bob, how you doing? Oh, shit, my cover's blown. What the hell? Anyway, uh, the PI license is effective because if I'm investigating you— I see you coming before you do. Make sense? Yeah. Give you an example. Fuck. Ethics out the window, you know? People say to me, oh, you know, well, what, what are you doing? You, you know, you're, uh, you're a private investigator. You're a journalist. Isn't there a conflict of interest there? I don't see one. I just think it, you know, it's more effective tools at my disposal. Databases, deep proprietary databases. Um, just that measure of authority when I introduce myself and I flash him that. What do you see there, Carl? Um, I unfortunately have bad vision. You see a bad. <laughs> you, you see a. You see a badge that looks like a sheriff's badge. Yeah, yeah. Now, far be it from me to steal valor from any of our fine law, en- law enforcement. That is actually Backstreet Investigations, who I was working for for many, many years, or working with, I should say. And now the guy who owns the company, he's doing a digit in federal prison on an extortion beef. So uh, I had to find another partner. Now I'm working with an ex-sheriff's detective. His name is Michael Venags. And uh, everything's going swimmingly. Now let me tell you an example of how uh, my private and my PI work uh, sort of uh, started to become journalistic work. And the consequences therein. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was moonlighting for a guy named Cameron Segal. He has a company, a real estate company, uh, on Sunset and Gardner. That's in Hollywood, folks. It's pretty much in the bowels of Hollywood right there. And he's basically an L.A. slumlord. He's uh, Indian by descent. And um, he... Hired me on. I, you know, I was like moonlighting with the guy. Oh, can you do a background check? You know, he's got tenants, he's sketchy tenants he's worried about. He wants to find out, you know, who he's renting his places to in these shithole SROs downtown, right? And so um, he hires me on, and it's going, you know, he pays me well. He pays me on time, blah, 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 blah. And then one day he says, Ebner, come down to the office. So I go down to the office, and he's sitting there, and he shows me these spreadsheets, And it's like about, I don't even know what it was, but it was basically uh, spreadsheets of how many clicks something was getting via Yahoo, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, Ebner, I'm six million deep. And I said, what? And I looked at the papers again. And I looked at him. And I said, have you gotten dividend checks? And he goes, yeah, they're paying me $50,000 $50,000 a week dividends. I could live off that for the rest of my life. Wow. So, you know, so I'm saying, wow, nice payday, man. But let me scrutinize this a little more. So you're six million deep in this little thing that you can't really describe to me and I can't describe on paper. I said, buddy, this is a straight Ponzi scheme. Okay. He's like, what? And I said, yeah, it's a Ponzi scheme. Those First two payments you got for 50 large, don't expect any more after that. They were just tickling your balls, 
making you think that there was, you know, some sort of profit in, in this non-venture. Who is this guy? And then I look at the guy who perpetrated this Ponzi scheme on a guy named Nikhil Jazawala, another Indian guy. Wow. Yeah, I look at him and I see what kind of shit he's into. And then I go back to Cameron and I have my buddy who's now doing the single digit in federal prison. He was with me at the time. I look at him. He looks at me. I look at Cameron Seagal and I say, buddy, I say, this is going to end one of two ways. You go to the feds. You go to the FBI right now. I got a contact for you there, okay? I got a control agent that'll work this case. And maybe, just maybe, somewhere down the line, you may see pennies back on your dollar. But that $6 million, my friend, poof. Sorry, buddy. It's gone. Wow. He started freaking out. He picked up the phone. He started threatening this guy, Nikhil Jazawala, the guy who was working the Ponzi on him. I said, that's not good. I said, I didn't tell you the other part, brother. I said, two ways. One, you may get pennies back on the dollar. The other is you're going to wind up dead. Okay? This isn't, this isn't pen, nickels and dimes here. This is $6 million. Okay? Two days go by, I get a call from my partner, Dan O'Hanks, <laughs> currently doing time for extortion in federal prison. Not Dan, he gave me a call. He goes, Ebner, put on the television. I put on the news. And uh, his office, uh, Cameron Segal's office there on Sunset and Gardner, yellow taped off. Homicide, crime scene. Wow. Okay? So I go... Dano, meet me there. We jump in our respective vehicles. I'm rolling in from uh, uh, Pasadena. He's rolling in from Burbank. We get there. We go to the cops. We give them our file. I hand him the file with the guy who was running the Ponzi on him. I said, I think this is your guy. We give him, you know, we give him all the information. Cameron Segal took two bullets in the head that night from a guy who, as he was after he had gotten into his Bentley, you know, a high-end, late-model Bentley with uh, bulletproof windows, no less, tinted windows. He gets in that. Some guy came up on him in the alley behind his place of uh, where he employs people and uh, showed up on a bike, twenty-two caliber, right through the window. Boom, boom, double tap. Shot One shot caught him in the neck. The other shot caught him in the head. And this motherfucker lived. He survived. What? Okay. Now, what happens is he's taken to uh, ICU, Cedar sinai Hospital. I, I mean, obviously, the guy's a multimillionaire. He's getting the best of care. Uh, they pump him full of fentanyl. You know, that's the shit that's killing people, a grain or less right now. But in a situation like this, they had to induce a coma. And there he sat in a bed and his company called me and they said, Ebner, we need you to stand guard at uh, Cedar sinai And I, I was like, you know, exec protect ain't exactly my thing, but you know what? I'll do it and I'm going to charge you this much. I set my rate. I hired another guy to come on. We did 12-hour shifts back-to-back 24-7. And what happened was, while he's lying there, all hooked up, intubated, and hooked up to all these machines and all that, his broken teeth are in a little glass aside of uh, of his bed. Every single motherfucker who came in there to visit him was dirty. Because you got (laughs) to understand, I'm running checks on him. You know, I'm looking over at their phone. One of the guys who professed to be one of his best friends, I he, he opens his fo- phone. I peek over at it, and the first number I see is a known Ponzi artist. So I'm like, there's nothing good about this. So I had to break my silence. I went to the FBI myself. I told them who Ponzied him. Uh, through a series of events and other victims that I was able to put together, they found that guy, Nicole. Nikhil Joshua, the feds did up in uh, Contra Costa County, California, and they put cuffs on him and they put him away. Cameron Segal, you know, he survived. I don't know how he's doing. He called me to threaten me the other day because I've been talking about him. I've been talking shit about him on a live mic. Just make sure he doesn't threaten me. Fuck please. him. He's, he's telling me that I signed an NDA. I don't remember doing that. But I also witnessed a capital crime. 
several times over. So, in other words, it's only it's my duty to report it right here, right now, in the gray zone. So, welcome. Ah, so we're up here uh, <laughs> above the HMS Bounty. That's all I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to say. Sure. You're getting a little nervous. I mean, you slightly. Know, well, here's the thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Carl, you're a big dude. <laughs> That's true. You yes. can take them in a fight. Yeah. All your enemies. Okay. Yeah, I've survived two muggings. That's there you okay. go. Don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. You're a survivor. Yeah. So I'm uh, currently reporting for the Daily Beast, and I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I back a few years, they said, Ebner, can we reprint your story from 2004 called uh, I Warned You About Bill Cosby? Oh, Lord. And I said, sure, you can reprint it, and you can also pay me for it, and they did. They did, and they did. Story came out. I told you so. And the problem was, imagine the pushback I got for that. You know, because in 2004, when I'm trying to tell the story about Bill Cosby, nobody wanted to hear it. Right down to my own agent at the William Morris Endeavor Agency. Joni, I love you. You were the head of the book department there. But when I came to you with what I wrote saying I wanted to write a book about Bill Cosby, jello man, rapist. (laughs) Oh, my. You said, Ebner, you screamed at me, didn't you, lady? You screamed at me and you said... Mark, do you realize how long Mr. Cosby has been a client of William Morris Endeavor? And I was like, honey, is that a deal breaker? And she's like, I'm afraid it is, Mark. And I'm like, I'm afraid you're fired. Whatever. I can't even get my own representation to back me on a story because of some conflict of interest. But remember, Bill Cosby was very powerful back then. In fact... He was paused to buy an entire network. He was ready to make a bid on NBC. Yeah. Yeah. No shit, right? So that's Hollywood. You know, they didn't give a shit about Bill Cosby. In fact, half these people knew he was a serial rapist. Any, certainly anybody who ever crossed his path at the Playboy Mansion you know, had to raise an eyebrow or two when he would leave a room and they'd bring another playmate out on a stretcher. You know what I'm saying? Wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. Ask James Kahn about that. Oh. Yeah. Talk to Jimmy Kahn about uh, Mr. Cosby's antics at the Playboy Mansion. He'll he'll give you an earful. He was not a fan, I take it, or was he? Well, he probably was. Who Uh, knows? Okay. I, I, I... I'm just giving you a little, uh, a little thing, a little something for you to take a note on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So with that, it was no accident that a couple of years later I get a call several months ago from my editor at the Daily Beast, and he's asking me, Ebner. I mean, this is literally how the phone call went. Who's next? He didn't know that I had a pal in New York who had called me up and he said, Ebner, I love your shit, man. I read your book, Six Degrees of Paris Hilton. I can spit that back to you uh, chapter and verse, man. And not only that, but I'm the real deal. Yeah, he was legit. You know, it wasn't just some weird fucking stalker fan thing. The guy had something to tell me. And what he had to tell me was he had a woman who was a victim, a rape victim. And the perpetrator of that rape was one... David Blaine. Now, so I'm, you know, this happened as I'm getting the phone call from the Daily Beast asking me who's next. And I say, I got somebody for you. In fact, the victim is on a plane right now coming to Los Angeles. I'm going to sit down with her and she's going to tell me on the record for attribution what happened to her at the hands of David Blaine going back to i think it was uh 2004 when this incident occurred she had to live with that being allegedly drugged and raped by david blaine she had to live with that from 2004 until she got it together enough her life was over man you know you run the gamut you rape ptsd Mm -hmm. uh just 
com- paralytic fear. You can't go out in public. You can't socialize. You don't, you're blaming yourself. I mean, the myriad things that happen to women as a result of this ungodly crime. 